Hey there, family. Thanks so much for tuning in to online worship today. The church is at Camp Kalakwa today. We are having our annual church retreat. If you've never been, I hope that next year you can plan to be there because it is absolutely amazing. And if for whatever reason you just weren't able to make it this year, make plans to be here next year. Yeah, I've got a busy road right behind me, but we are going to have a blast out here. But we've put together a super special, uh, some of our favorite uh, worship experiences uh, for you today, and I know you're going to get blessed by that. So sit back and allow Jesus to bless you.
so good when God can just take things that are in our lives and turn those things around. I feel like the Sabbath is that too. He gives us that day to reset from our tired, long week. And we get to praise him. And when God guides us, sometimes he's in that driver's seat. He says, you know what? I'm driving right now. And you just sit in the passenger side and hang out. Trust me, I got you.
move through life that way. And I believe that sometimes we choose who we want to be with, what communities, what churches. I have the privilege every single month to ask that question. We call it new member orientation. As a matter of fact, most of you, a lot of you probably have gone through new member orientation if you've come to this church in the last five to 10 years. New member orientation is where I get a chance to say, hey, what drew you to our community? What was it that brought you here? And a lot of times it's, hey, I really like the accepting uh, warmth of this church, or I really love the, you know, the way in which you, you, you promote your welcome statement, or sometimes it's, hey, I really like the Sabbath schools or the teachers or the preacher, and, and we just, you know, we have these different pieces that we put in there, but we can't really, we, most of the time, we're not really saying stuff like, well, you're the closest church, I've measured it, it's only three and a half miles, and that's the exact reason it's four and a half miles, no, nobody usually says that, thank goodness. There's, there's other reasons for it. So when I ask the second question, it's much more not so much about what we're doing to hopefully attract, but it's now their opportunity to see where they're at because they've already been given. They know the mission. They know the values and they know the, the way in which we understand our, you know, how we see this whole thing playing out on our mission, vision, and, and values. And then they get a chance to say, well, how they will respond. So I asked this question, why do you want to be a part of this community? Why do you want to, why do you see yourself in this church? Not because we want it, we want it to be a fit. We want it to be a place for growth. So that question I think was asked in a way, and that's, you heard it when the singers were singing. I think Jesus asked that question in a way with his disciples. It says when he was in a quiet place, it says he asked his disciples, you know, Luke, by the way, in Luke chapter 9, positions this question right after the feeding of the 5,000. And so these disciples have been, they've watched as all these, and there's a little bit of popularity going on here. There's a lot of things going on. And Jesus says to them, he says, hey, by the way, you've been around, you've been, you've been hearing things, you've had your ear to the ground, so to speak. What are people, are, what are they saying about me? Who do they say that I am? And, and then, they, of course, you had the text by Jess. She read it this morning. Well, some people think that you're John the Baptist all over again. Some people think that you're Elijah or one of the old prophets reborn. But you, he says, you who have been with me, you who have not been on the outside looking in through the windows, so to speak, you have been walking, journeying with me. What do you say? And Peter pipes up, we believe you're the Messiah. Now, now Luke doesn't take it much further than that. He, he moves into a kind of a leadership part, but John goes deeper with this. You see, John does the same thing in a little different way. John now moves it to the time the next day after the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus comes in on that shoreline and he's met by quite a few people. And these are people that are followers. These are people that have been kind of checking Jesus out. These are people that had agendas. And they were kind of wondering, who is this guy? I, wanna, I think he's pretty, a pretty decent guy. I'm wondering if his agenda will fit in with mine. Or I wonder if somehow, and they might be a little more opportunistic, I wonder if maybe, you know, I could thrive if, if this works out, then, you know, maybe I could be a part of that group as well. However it was, Jesus set them straight in a really, really big way. He says there's no compromise. There's no way in which you can do your thing and my thing too. You either have to take all of me or none of me. He gave them a pretty harsh example of what that meant. And a lot of them really thought it was too much. A lot of them really kind of got exasperated. Some got angry. And so this is what happened. They said, after this, many of the disciples left and no longer wanted to associate with him. And so Jesus turns to his 12, or he turns to those that were in this inner circle again, and he says, do you want to leave too? And Peter responds, he says, 
where would we go? You have the words of life. And then he says, besides, we're already committed. We're already with you. We've already made that decision. You know, in counseling, there's three things that usually needs to be present if change is going to happen. I think Jesus was looking to see if shift was taking place. If they were actually starting to see what Christ was really about. And I think he was interested in seeing the progression of their thinking and their choosing and then the way in which they would direct their lives. He wanted to see that shift. In counseling, three things. Number one, a, a reimagining or a reframing or a re, in a sense, rethinking of how things are to how things could be. So alternative understandings. And by the way, if you look around, there's a lot of alternative thinking in this room. It's just good. Nothing wrong with that. It's just you get a chance to rub shoulders with people who don't think like you. That's not a bad thing. That's just an opportunity to be curious and take it for what it might represent or be for your life. Number two, there needs to be a trusting relationship, a relationship that is based highly on a high degree, high level of trust. And then there also needs to be what Peter said, there needs to be commitment, a commitment to that change for it to really take place, a commitment to that process. As the spirit was moving over the waters, we become move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the waters, we become move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. So calm down, spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me calm down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart now. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. Come to this place with your presence. What you've been through today, but sing out these words to God. Sing. As the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move over. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Oh, as the spirit was moving over the water, the spirit come move.
what does, what is the result of connection? When we, if we were to take the theme this year and just do it perfectly, what would be the result? And I would say that you could make the argument that the Acts chapter 2 church might have the answer in it of what the result is when we are fully connected with each other and when we're fully connected with God. Acts 2, as it closes out, says, A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes uh, for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day... The Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So, I want to preach for a little bit, but you can, like, while I'm preaching, if your mind is going to wander, let it wander to the question of, as I read through that text, what's the result of connection with God and connection with others? Can I um, just tell you that my opinions on this really kind of took an important step when I had the opportunity to be the youth pastor of this church. This is the Brentwood Avenue Church in Auckland, New Zealand. 1997, I took a year out of college between my freshman and my sophomore year to go serve as a youth pastor at this church. Um, It was a long trip, might I say, from the east coast of the United States to Auckland, New Zealand. It was on the, in another hemisphere. And that was something that I kind of discovered kind of quickly that really I'd known, but I didn't really get it. I left... I left at the uh, end of uh, July um, from South Carolina, where I'd been working at summer camp. It had been a historically hot at that point, summer 1997. And I flew across the world down into the Southern Hemisphere where it was winter. And I knew it was going to be winter, but I didn't really know it was going to be winter. Because it is one thing, it's a crazy thing to go from the middle of summer to the middle of winter in less than 24 hours. It is a, it's weird. If you've never done it, it's not really something you really have to try out, I don't think. But if you want to, you could. And if I may, there are some times when a, a feeling a sensation, something other than uh, visual or auditory, where something you feel really stays ingrained with you and colors your experience. And I will say that if I was going to use one word to summarize what I felt, and even as I look at this picture, I felt the word cold. Because all my friends who had gone to be youth pastors in Australia and New Zealand, all my friends who had done that in, in the college I was at, they told me about how like the entire church would show up at the airport. This is before 9-11. And everybody would show up at the airport and welcome you there. They'd be like, hey, welcome to our church. No. That's how many people were at the airport for me. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, it was you, Ken. <laughs> be nice. Be gentle. Be gentle. You could hurt my feelings. <laughs> there were three people at the airport. And the, the coldness of the air matched the coldness of the reception. Um, the, they were holding up a sign that said my name on it, and it was a very elderly couple and a middle-aged guy. And the middle-aged guy was the first to say, he said, hi, my name is, and I am the pastor of the Brentwood Church and another church. Welcome to New Zealand. These are the people that are going to be taking care of you. I hope you have a good stay here. See ya. Okay, so I gathered my luggage, went with the couple out to their car, and I'm telling you, the door had not completely closed before the man started just unloading on the pastor. I mean, I'm not like saying he like minorly was irritated. I'm talking like full bore, I hate that pastor, and congratulations on being here because you're going to be the pastor. You heard him say he has two churches. You're going to be the pastor of the Brentwood Church. And that's why we brought you here. So have fun. Um, and I thought, well, maybe this is just an aberration. Maybe this man doesn't really know what he's talking about. Went to church the first Sabbath. People were nice. 
and uh, got invited to potluck. I got to potluck and realized not everybody had been invited to potluck. They said, hi, we're the people who hate the pastor. They didn't really say that, but that's what they said, okay? <laughs> and you're going to be, we're, uh, we're just letting you know right now, it's time for your coronation, whatever, and uh, you're going to be our pastor, and um, we want you to know you, uh, you have the support of the board to do this. We have 51% that are behind you. Now, I'm not good at math. <laughs> but I did the math kind of quickly, and in my head I said, okay, there's 51% that voted for you to come here. Wait a minute, that means 49% didn't want me here. <laughs> I did, redid the math because I don't trust myself, and it came out the same way again. And I was cold. Because <laughs> I have never been a, I've always been a pretty self confident person, but even I realized that a kid who had just finished his first year of theology wasn't probably ready to do a hostile takeover <laughs> of a church. So it was an interesting year because 51% of the church was deeply disappointed that Ken wasn't taking things over, not stepping up to the bat, not doing what needed to be done. And 49% of the church just was waiting for it to happen. He's a sneaky one. He's played the long game. It was a church divided. It was a cold church. I mean, there were warm people in the church. I think back and I... I I hope that if any of them are listening today, they don't feel disrespected because there's some really warm people in that church, but it was, as a group, it was cold. You know what I mean by that? As a group, it was just cold. So uh, this is the environment that I got to hang out in um, for almost a year. Very formidable part of my life. I credit that first real <laughs> baptism under fire on the philosophy that I've come to believe in when it comes to churches. This is what it looks like in action here at Whole Life. We invite into community. You invite people into community. Did you notice it doesn't say you invite people to attend Whole Life? That's intentional. You invite people into community. I'm not talking to your neighbor, I'm talking to you. You invite people into community. What does, what does inviting somebody into community look like? It means maybe talking to them around the water cooler at work. Maybe you find out they have a hobby that's similar to yours, and you start doing that with them. Maybe it's just listening to somebody who's going through a difficulty. I remember a coworker of mine before I worked within the denominational employment, a coworker of mine was going through a divorce. We worked very closely. For me, it was riding in the car and listening to the pain he was going through. The crazy thing was he said, what gets you through hard times? I said, for me, it's my relationship with God. He said, well, I've been meaning to listen to the Bible, but I don't ever understand it when I do. Can we listen to the Bible while we drive to our different appointments? I didn't bring it up, he did. It's amazing to me when we invite people into community how little preaching we have to do and just how much being we have to do. Being in community, inviting somebody into your orbit to be part of what you do. Living life together. We invite people into community, that's the first thing. When we invite people into community, the next thing we do is we don't go in because what a lot of times we think of in evangelism is, I'm going to become friends with you. I'm going to invite you into community so that I can make sure that you come to whole life, so that you can become a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> we invite people into community so that they can be connected with God and have a better connection with others. Everything else is gravy. That's where it's at. And when we really care about somebody... We're not there to invite them into community so I can impart my wisdom to them. We invite somebody into community so that we can listen. Tell me about you. What's going on in your life? How are your kids doing? What's happening at work? 
How's, how's things going? What do you enjoy doing? How do you feel about the playoff picture right now? <laughs> nah, I agree. So, we listen. That's active listening. That's active listening. We ask questions. So many times we think that we've heard somebody. We think we've been listening. We've been making the good eye contact. We didn't pick up our phone. And we hear them say something, but we never stop to ask to be sure that we heard. So I heard you. Am I hearing you right that you're, 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 you're really worried about your marriage right now? Yeah, I am. Were you needing somebody to listen to you? Yeah, I need somebody to listen to you, but I'm looking for a counselor, not like if I, need, I, got, I need something bigger than a person. Okay, well, that's helpful information. Ask questions. Ask questions to understand, to know, not to win an argument, to understand, to hear. The next thing that we ask you as our evangelistic team is that when you've listened, when you've asked questions, and when you hear a need for connection or a need, that you equip and provide resources as needed and requested. Notice as requested parted. Sometimes people didn't ask for you to do what you did. Make sure that that's what they want before you call me up and sit me down with them for a meal. Seriously, I've showed up at some really awkward meals. <laughs> oh, you brought your pastor. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> With that said, maybe you don't know how to, maybe they ask you a question that you don't understand about the Bible, or maybe that you, you don't understand, they're, maybe, they're, maybe they're going through the, some financial difficulties, and you don't, you're, not a, you know, you're not a financial wizard, you don't know what to do. Maybe they're about to be evicted, you're not sure what to say. Well, at that point, I'd invite you to send an email or text message or call to Anderling. Our team, our pastoral team is here to equip and to resource you so that you can resource the people you've invited into community. The cool thing is Anderling has a lot of knowledge and a lot of, she can give you some really great information about resources and things that are available when it comes to people who may be going through difficulty in our community. But if you're wanting to know some Bible questions, talk to, to Melanie, myself, um, Freud, uh, Anderlene. There's a bunch of us on staff that would be more than happy to, to, if we don't know the answer, we know how to find answers. Happy to do that. Well, maybe, maybe you're uh, the person who loves music, but it hasn't been involved, would love to get involved with a musical group, but doesn't know where to go. Talk to Albert. I would be happy to talk to you about what it takes to be involved with music here and something that can get people involved. What I'm trying to say is think about the people on our staff and then think about how they can help you provide the resources and equipping that you need to reach that person in your community. The final thing that I want you to do is repeat steps one through four in whatever order. We don't stop listening. We don't stop asking questions. And we don't stop inviting somebody into community when they don't show up at whole life in the time frame that we thought they should. In fact, we don't stop inviting them into community if they never show up at whole life. Because our goal, our goal is to love people. And loving people doesn't have a hidden motive behind it. Invite people into community and love them for who they are. Not for what you hope they'll do. Of course I hope people will come to whole life because I think whole life is amazing and I think it'll make their life better. But if they don't think it'll make their life better, I don't want to force somebody to do something that's not making their life better. I just want you to know Jesus. I just want your life to be changed because Jesus changed my life and I believe he'll change yours too. So, I need to move a little quicker. <laughs> I was asked to do an evangelistic series using our youth at, at the church, Brentwood. And I knew it was going to be a disaster because I knew nobody was going to show up. The other part is, why do I want to invite people into a dysfunctional atmosphere? You know, it's kind of like, if you know you're going to get divorced choosing to have a child, 
at that same time. Why are you going to do that? And sometimes we do that. We're in a dysfunctional place and we invite people to come to it and we're surprised when they're not (laughs) drawn to it. So I didn't know what to do. And so I said, well, maybe could I do something different? Could we do maybe more of a... at, At summer camp, we have this play on Friday nights that we do that uses modern music, and people don't have to learn lines, they just kind of act out the song, and it's really kind of cool. We, we basically tell the story of God's love for this world that kind of starts in the Garden of Eden. We jump to Jesus' life, we jump to his death, resurrection, and then we jump to Jesus' second coming. And they say, yeah, let's give that a shot, let's, let's do that. And the coolest thing happened, because to do that required not just the kids to do it, but it required the entire church to come together. People had to build things. People had to build sets. They had to make costumes. They had to practice several times a week. And suddenly people who didn't like each other were being forced to be in contact with each other several times a week in order to create something that was going to be successful. And you know what happened? It's an incredible thing that even when people who don't like each other spend time together, they may never ever love each other, but they start to understand each other. And it was the craziest thing. It was completely unintentional on my part. To me, it was the Holy Spirit doing something really cool. But that church came together in a way that was just crazy. They bonded because they were thinking about Jesus and his life. Through They had to think about the parts they were playing. They started thinking about that vertical connection with God more. And then, but they also at the same time had to think about that horizontal connection with each other. And suddenly, all these cool people at this church actually started loving each other and became a warm place to be. A wonderful place. And the coolest thing for me was not that everybody showed up at the airport to see me off, which they did. The coolest thing was to call when I got back home to check in and let them know I made it safely and to talk to my good friend. And my good friend said, Ken, the coolest thing, the pastor invited everybody over to his house after you flew out and everybody came. I cannot begin to tell you what a 180 that was. Because God does incredible things when we focus on the vertical and horizontal relationships.
Until I lay my head I will see Of the goodness of God
We're going to stand for this last song. God's love is amazing. He loves you so much. So much. Today, we just want to praise Him. For I spoke a word, you sing it over me. You have been so good. You have been so, so good. So Listen together, church. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so good. You have been so, so good to me.
Family, I hope you were blessed by that worship service. We are going to be back at our building in Orlando next Sabbath. So we hope to see you there. And don't forget, make plans to attend next year's camp retreat out at Camp Clock. What you won't want to miss is going to be a special one, just as they all are. God bless you. Let's have a quick prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your blessings today. We ask that you would watch over each person. And thank you so much. They're a part of our whole life family. We pray in your name. Amen. All right, family. I love you. Go love your world. Thank you.